In this episode, Golden and I discuss Birds of Prey. Full speed ahead. Welcome to the Omega Beam number 65. I'm your host, Oren Merton. So kicking off 2020's superhero movies is the next movie in the DCEU. Birds of Prey and the Fantabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinn. That title is a mouthful, so we're usually going to just be calling it Birds of Prey. So Golden and I definitely go into spoilers. And if you haven't seen this film yet, and if you haven't, you should. Then if spoilers matter, be sure and see the movie first. If they don't matter to you, well, you've been warned and that's cool. All right, here we go. So let's talk about Birds of Prey and the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn, which we'll probably just call Birds of Prey from now on because that's a mouthful. It is. But it is a fun title. And I think the title itself kind of gives you an idea already of what kind of film this is. This is clearly not a film that takes itself too seriously. Oh, definitely. So there's going to be spoilers, just letting you know. So... What do you think? They're not only maybe spoilers, but if we're quoting them, it there may be language that is uh, profane. Well, we have slightly. to keep the profanity a little bit down, unfortunately, because of the rules. But okay, well, all right, it, it will be edited then. That's right. So, what did you think? I thought it was it was very entertaining. I would agree. It was extremely. It was it was pretty fast paced, while at the same time giving the story enough room to breathe. I think one of the reasons it was able to have as good of a story as it did and still move is because unlike a lot of movies based on comic book material these days, this was not sort of a save the world epic grand scope of a film. It was a small film. It was a neighborhood film. And there were there were times where it seemed to drag a little bit for me. But there was still enough that kept me engaged and entertained. And yes, it's not a save the world. It's it's not even necessarily a just save Harley. It's 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 a little bit more than that. I think the trailer does a pretty good idea of putting the plot out there that there's a girl, and for some reason, the uh, Ewan McGregor character, Black Mask, and AKA, he is Ewan McGregor is absolutely just fantastic oh he absolutely is he plays he, he milks that role for every little aspect of it yeah the character is roman sionis um aka black mask and yeah he does a fantastic job playing the character honestly they all do i mean margot robbie owns harley quinn as far as i'm concerned oh yeah no and it's really amazing. I know that you did some research and, you know, she did all her own stunts. And mm -hmm. I'm just sitting there during the movie, just amazed at, for those of you that play D&D, &D, um, I think that Margot Robbie may not even have a dex of 18. It may be higher. <laughs> uh, she just really makes it look so natural. Absolutely. And it really helps out the movie that all the actresses did their own stunts because it means that the camera can get angles that you don't necessarily get in action movies where it's always a stunt double. You know, there's how many times have you seen an action movie where it's always cutting to medium shots or you're watching them from behind or whatever, because they're basically trying to uh, hide the fact that it's a stunt double doing a lot of this stuff. But in this movie, the main actresses, it's them. They're out there. They're, this is, real gymnastics and, and, you know, real combat skills. And, and it makes it very, very visceral and very exciting. It, I mean, this doesn't have the kind of characters flying around choreography that you get in the huge sci-fi or whatever it a films. a little bit of it. A little bit, but not a ton. I mean, come on. She does a backflip onto a car on roller skates. And you can't do that? <laughs> yeah. Of course, there are... Things like that, but it's it's generally much more grounded than you're going to get if you're dealing with science fiction characters like Superman or Green Lantern or somebody like that. So, well, well, Bruce Wayne was in it. He just was 
looking like a hyena. Yeah, well, his name was definitely in it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, speaking of Batman, skipping to the the very, very end of the movie, they sort of subvert your expectation for an after credit scene by simply having Harley Quinn saying, oh, so you stayed till the end of the movie? Okay, well, let me give you this, uh, the secret of Batman. And then it just ends. And she starts to say it and then yeah. it just cuts it off. It was pretty. Very cute. It was cute. And, and again, that's the kind of movie this is. This is a movie that it's it's not designed to be a deep, heavy drama. It's designed to be fun and fast. And then you get that from just even the opening. Yeah. The opening goes back to this animation yeah. of Harley Quinn's or Harleen Quinzel's backstory. Yeah. And the animation is just very cute, but it's spot on. This movie is part of the DCEU, the DC Extended Universe, but at the same time, this isn't a sequel to Suicide Squad. This is its own thing. It's it's I think what they're doing is is really smart. It's like Shazam and uh Aquaman. Now this movie, you don't need to see any movies. They're not really tied to any other movies, but they're done with an awareness of other movies. Like Shazam had an awareness of Superman and Batman and all these other things. Aquaman gave a one sentence um, yes, Justice League happened. This gives a one sentence, yes, Suicide Squad happened. And that's it. And then we're done. Then it's its own unique have, thing. And you have very strong characters. Yes. And each of the characters has their own little backstory. Yeah. Which is, and it just, it's done very briefly and very well. And in Huntress's case, very much ties in, ties back to the story. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of of the Huntress and and Birds of Prey, um, we already mentioned that 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 Mary Elizabeth Winstead, who plays Huntress, and um, also I want to single out Journey Smollett Bell, who does Dinah Lance and Black Canary. Both of these characters are on the TV or were um, characters in the TV show Arrow, and so just like with Grant Gustin and, and the Flash, the films had a little bit of a challenge in the sense that they had to create characters that were unique and separate from the TV persona so that you're not constantly watching it saying, I don't know, I've been watching Arrow for eight years and this is my Black Canary, you know. But th I think they did a really good job of creating unique characters that fit the movie completely. And I never once said, oh, but I really like, you know, Katie Cassidy or Katie Lotz or you know, whomever playing Black Canary on, on Arrow. I mean, I really just got into the movie versions yeah, of these characters. She just got to be her own character. Yeah. And from the beginning, I mean, she's just a good person. Yes. She she can't let Harley, Harley be taken. Mm -hmm. um, she's just a good person. Even Huntress is still yeah. a good person. The, the detective is a good person. Right. And then you have Harley and Cassandra Kane. Who are, you know, Cassandra King could be a good person. Right. Um, this version of the character is just mainly focusing on her being a thief, mm -hmm. which for me, I think of the characters, the Cassandra King character was probably the weakest. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I've read a lot of tweets of Gail Simone, who is the the author of the Bird of Prey comics, and she basically took it. She was given it right after she left Marvel. She'd been doing Deadpool. DC hired her to do Birds of Prey. They told her flat out, we are canceling this title and we want you to just take it over um, un until we cancel it in, you know, whatever, six months, a year, what have you. And she said, thank you. Great. Love it. And of course, it became huge. And she did it for three years until they gave her Wonder Woman. And after she did Wonder Woman, she came back to Birds of Prey and it became huge again. So she takes these characters very, very personally and she loved the movie. She did the only thing that she criticized was Cassie Kane, that she thought their version of Cassandra Kane was enough different from her own that she felt it really missed well, out. All of the all of the characters except for Cassandra Kane really just stand on their own. Mm -hmm. And I think that that character could have been stronger. Yeah. Still scared for her life and still yeah. wanting the help of these other strong women. But I just felt like the character was, oh, I'm going to be helpless and I just need you to drag me along. Yeah. And, and what's, I think, particularly unfortunate about that, and we talked about this when we had just seen the movie, is that 
when you're introduced to Cassandra Kane, she seems very strong. And that's how the character started. And it seems like once she became the target, that her the strength that they'd introduced her with kind of went away and she became a more traditional damsel in distress. Which is not to say she never has moments where she sticks up for herself or she does cool things, but in general, her role was to hide while everyone else was doing stuff. And, and Huntress needs something to work towards. Right. As soon as her goals are achieved, it's like, um, okay, well, I don't really have anything to do now. Well, why don't you join us? Sure. <laughs> and I mean, but she's really just, she's really a strong, resourceful character. Yeah. She just, her social skills are lacking because I don't think she grew up in the environment to gain the social skills that right. she really And I, I loved I loved how the movie made fun of that by both showing you her practicing how to say, you know, do you know who I am? And yeah. then having other people just have no idea and and making her frustrated, you know, because her practice wasn't paying off. So I thought that was uh it, Do you it, recognize me? Right, exactly. Did you rec- is it was that? Yeah. And it was it was funny. It was done very very well. And I think, you know, talk about female empowerment. This is a film where it was pitched by Margot Robbie, a woman. The director, Kathy Yan or Yan maybe, is a woman. The writer, Christina Hodgson, is a woman. So this this movie has a different kind of energy, you know, just like I I loved in, in Wonder Woman with um, Patty Jenkins directing it. It is, it's subtle in that you can have these starlets basically in wet t-shirts, but it never is exploitive. You know, no matter how much gymnastics they're doing, you know, there, there's a huge difference. You know, people had talked about online, the huge difference between when Patty Jenkins would both dress and film, uh, you know, Wonder Woman in the Amazons and Zack Snyder did and how Zack Snyder had them all showing belly button, which just from a combat point of view is pretty dumb. And she'd, you know, he'd, he'd place the camera like right behind Gal Gadot's butt when he's filming Bruce Wayne and Justice League, because, you know, obviously that's appealed to him. Um, whereas that kind of shot doesn't exist. It's a very economical way that she directs the movie and it's always about the character but it's also not taking away yeah from their femininity absolutely oh they're very feminine and the costumes the costumes a lot of the costumes are just over the top oh yeah and it was funny because walking out of the theater there was someone at the theater wearing the yellow Uh jumper and then i had to go back to the theater for a moment and my way leaving i passed by someone wearing what she was wearing earlier uh-huh. With the all of the frizzy, right. you know, um, all of the little sparkly yeah. stuff and the pink top. Yeah. And I told her, you should check out, you know, make sure you go take a picture with the other Harley. Yes. She's, she's sitting there at the bar. It's, and, it's a but, really and cool look. And there was also this nostalgia. They open up a chest and, no, she doesn't want anyone wearing daddy's little monster. Right. That, that, that's, no, uh, save that one. Yeah. But yet she still takes out the other one and it's bulletproof and she gives right. that to the officer. Because you need protection for the ladies. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and it, this is a very colorful movie. You know, one of the big criticisms that I had that a lot of people had in the sort of, uh, let's say, Batman v. Superman slash Suicide Squad era of the DCEU is it was very, very bleak and grim and the colors were very dark and muted and this is like a kaleidoscope splash I mean, of have, color. You have her going through all of the reasons why people want to kill her. Yes. And it's just like flashing by all of these different ways. And it's getting faster and faster until you can no, you can no longer read them. Right. And I'm sure that there are people out there that are just waiting mm. to be able to go frame by frame. Oh, sure. And read every single one of those reasons. Absolutely. Yeah. On, a, on, on Twitter, I don't remember who somebody semi-famous said that, said, I can't wait to freeze frame every every screen every every frame so i can see you know what this particular you know text yeah but the, on the, the athleticism is. and the filming mm-hmm. and the ability 
of these women to do the scenes they do. Just thinking about the scene in the evidence room with Carly, and she finds a bat and her eyes light up. And if you ever want to know just how much damage you could do with a bludgeoning weapon, (laughs) I mean, she is... She has taken a, a feat in bat, and she's also taken expertise in bat. And she's one and of a, it's, of a it gives, expert. Yeah, yeah, it gives a new bouncing bats. Right. Is definitely, but she's just so skilled with it. Absolutely. And as much fun as the color and the action and the production and all of that is, there really is room for story. The movie begins with Harley being basically broken, that her relationship that she used to define herself has ended. And over the course of the movie, she redefines herself as instead of just a criminal, as someone who cares, she ends up caring about this, this, this girl. She ends up legitimately caring to the point that she risks herself in pretty severe ways to, to try and save her when she's in jeopardy. Is it, As much of a risk if she's as crazy as she is already? Oh, I think she knows what she's doing. So she she must know. She may not care about living, but she knows she's It was surprising. You know, talking about, you know, how Batman v Superman, a lot more grim. The the amount of, the body count of kids in this movie was a lot higher than a lot of other movies. That is true. A lot of collateral damage. Um, But yeah, speaking of, of, uh, of Grimm should mention this is an R-rated movie, mostly for language. That um, I was, I read that it was a little bit gory, and I was wondering if that meant there'd be like a couple scenes of like extreme blood, but there really isn't. I mean, there there, there was never any moments. I'm not someone who likes gore, and there was never really moments where I felt it was too gory. So I think in that sense, it's not. If, it's not a hard R. That's how I'd put it. And, and they had fun making fun of things. I yeah. mean, at one point, I looked at Harley on screen, and before I could even actually finish the thought in my head, one of the characters is like, when the F did she have time for a shoe change? Yeah. And I was like thinking that thought, and it was voiced out loud on the movie. Right. Yeah, they absolutely have fun. I, and, I do wonder if there will be a resurgence in four-wheeled skates. Because of her, yeah. Because of this, because... And that, by the way... They just, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, for those of you who don't follow the Harley Quinn character in the comics, um, a writer named Jimmy Palamati and his wife, a fantastic artist, Amanda Connor, um, they took the Harley Quinn comic and and blew it up into something that was absolutely special. And one of the things that they did was do their own costuming and their own. They, they were not held. It was all it was Harley by herself, not in Gotham, just just Harley doing her thing. And they made her um, a roller derby player. And so they clearly uh, adapted that for the movie and and they did it beautifully because that is that was one of the most fun parts of the comic and they brought it to life and it was it was as someone who knew that going in that was i love seeing it i did like how certain things came back Mm -hmm. so she she hears them over she overhears them talking about her and she tosses the drinks on the ground and yet at the end of the movie these these are real friends now, so right. yeah, let's let's we're gonna bring the drinks, and of course, that also leads into the skating later at the end of the movie, right? And you know that they they show you that Cassie picks up a grenade, so you're oh, just yeah. kind of waiting for that one to come back for the but the grenade to drop. What I didn't so to speak. necessarily expect to come back, but was pleasantly surprised, was the sandwich. Nah. The breakfast sandwich. You gotta have the best. You know, that was apparently the best egg sandwich in Gotham. But that was that was very nicely done. It was. I liked the uh, slow down, hit me with your best shot. Mm-hmm. That was the music was really wonderful. the The score is by Daniel Pemberton. And for those of you who listened to our last episode about our favorite scores of 2018, 
Uh, I gave an honorable mention to the very tail end of 2018 score by Daniel Pemberton of Into the Spider-Verse. This is another score where he was, just like Into the Spider-Verse, he is um, weaving score in between popular music and pop songs. And he he does it so well. And every every time there's a piece of score, it's so appropriate. And the pop music they chose whether it was a unique cover like Hit Me With Your Best Shot that you just mentioned, or it was an, uh, just a, a pop song that um, and some other tracks that I remembered yeah, at the time, and then the they end, all are appropriate. The end credits aren't like spectacular, but mm. they're very nice. Yeah. The art, the music is, is still really well done. Yeah, absolutely. Because at this point with most movies, the end credits are now more than just names written up there on the screen. Right, they make them entertaining. They make them part of the the cinema experience. And, and I like I think, that. I think it's nice because it's not just about the movie, but it really draws more attention to the yeah. people that have created the movie. Yeah. So this, th- this podcast is the spoiler one, so we're not talking to people who haven't seen it. But I did do a little reading. This is the first weekend. We're recording this on Sunday afternoon, so there's still some time to go. But I did read about the t- the ticket sales. Now, the nice thing about Birds of Prey is that compared to these multi hundred million dollar, you know, two hundred fifty million dollar Avengers movies or whatever, this was a quote unquote cheap movie to make. It cost eighty four and a half million, not even a hundred million to make, and so only needs to make about one one seventy or something before it's already profitable. So, unfortunately. This movie is rated R, which means it's going to make less money. This movie is released in a February, which is not a popular movie-going month, which means it's going to make less money. Unfortunately, movies with women as the marquee tend to not be as popular among, you know, the boys' club. So opening weekend, the worldwide gross so far for this movie has been about it's been over 80 million, which is almost the budget. So it's certainly not a flop or a failure, but it's far from a hit. It's it's the number one movie in America right now, but that's because, like I said, February is not a big a big movie month. So if you've got friends who are interested in seeing this, if you're thinking about, oh wow, after listening to this podcast, there's a bunch of things you didn't catch, and maybe you want to go see it again. Highly recommend you do that. We're, we end up seeing some of these movies multiple times. This may be one we do as well. I think it's worth seeing because it's a good movie, but also I think seeing a movie like this multiple times, getting your friends to see it, I think it does a service in the sense that one of the complaints about movies based on comic book material, and I'm not just talking about you know famous directors who've gone on rants, but in general, when people complain, it's that there tends to be a sameness, maybe, or that there tends to be, you know, that they're not as 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 differentiated or deep or whatever you want to be. So I think the fact that this is a smaller movie, this is a female-led movie, this is a different movie than an Avengers movie or whatever, I think that matters. And I think it's worth supporting it. And, you know, these studios, it's one thing to write an article, to put out a podcast, And that's all nice. I mean, this movie's been getting really good reviews and really good word of mouth. And that's important. You know, it's got 80, at the time of this writing, it's 82, I think, on Rotten Tomatoes. Eight out of 10 critics have loved this movie. Um, I personally listened to the BBC reviewer, Mark Kermode, and he loved this movie. So clearly it is not just a movie that we enjoyed because we're easy marks for this stuff, but it's a legitimately well put together film. The studios, however... As much as that's nice, and the fact that it's another good movie in the DCEU, what they really respond to is dollar signs. And so I think it's important that we support movies like this with our dollar signs, because that's, more than anything else, that is what is going to inspire them to make more movies like this. And I'd really like to see more movies like this, because this was a damn fine film. Yes. Well, thank you, Golden. You're welcome. And that's it for this episode. You can find the show notes at theomegabeam.com slash 65. 
If you like this episode, please leave a review in the Apple Podcasts app or wherever you listen to podcasts because the reviews help people who like this kind of thing find our podcast. If you have any comments or suggestions, just drop us a line at info at theomegabeam.com. Be good to yourselves and each other, and we'll catch you next time. Bye.